Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Play Action Podcast. It's Dave Farrell alongside Matt Brown and Joe Fortenbaugh, guys. Week number four of the NFL is here. And again, a week number three that was a little bit odd. And now that we have three no, no. weeks. It was totally wacky. It was, it was, pretty, it, it was, it was totally good. wacky. Let's just go ahead and let's call a spade yeah. a spade here. That, that was totally wacky. Joe and I texting back and forth. You and I texting back and forth. Week three, 10, underdog, 10 underdogs just on Sunday alone when it was just. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, strange. Yeah. But OK, now that we have three weeks under our belts, we should be able to make some observations that we feel at least confident is going to, to, to lend to how the rest of the season is going to go. But which ones are we to believe? Which ones are we not to believe? Matt, we'll start with you. What's something that you've noticed through three weeks that you think is maybe an overreaction and some things that you think is this is just how things are going to be this season? Yeah, I mean, I think for sure we came into this season thinking this Jaguars defense was going to be one of the best in the NFL and through three weeks I'm kind of a believer in everything that's going on on that side of the ball for that Jaguars team on the other side of the ball I'm still not buying into the offense or whatsoever for whatever reason Wait, Blake you're, you're going to say this the week after they put up listen, 44 listen, I was going to say for whatever reason Blake Bortles goes overseas they're talking about starting to call him like Sir Blake Bortles or whatever because he plays so much better <laughs> over there than he does over here so yeah. like my thought is is hey listen this team's not going to score very many points this defense is pretty elite so I'm going to be looking for opportunities Joe to play the under in any time that I think that maybe it is kind of been pushed a little bit too high because I do not believe in this offense whatsoever and I'm definitely a believer in this defense I don't need to see anything else to understand that something is severely wrong with quarterback Cam Newton in Carolina. He's completing less than 60% of his passes. He only has two touchdown passes through three games this season, four interceptions, and he's throwing for less than 200 yards per game. In addition to that, there are rumors out of Carolina that his teammates think his body is breaking down on him by the day. Cam Newton, we may have seen his best days moving forward. I'm not banking on him or this offense. Another sneaky play moving forward. I'm going to keep a close eye on the Chicago Bears when they play at Soldier Field. The defending NFC champion Falcons went in there in week one. The Bears gave them all they could handle and they covered the spread late. They didn't win, but they covered. Pittsburgh comes in this past weekend, one of the favorites in the AFC, and the Bears beat them outright. I don't think it's a great Bears team, and when we get to Thursday night's pick, Bears at Green Bay, we'll discuss later how we feel about them on the road, but for right now, this team playing at home, I think you got to take them seriously. Yeah, another team that I'm going to keep an eye on too is the Patriots, and again, the, the, the totals in those games, because this offense is running like a well-oiled machine. I did not think, I don't know how they keep doing it, taking all these retreads from all these other teams and turning it in to gold every single time, but they do it. Belichick, just an absolute wizard. However, that defense is not very good. So I'm going to be looking at totals here because they're going to score points and I think they're going to give up points as well, Joe. I think that we should be looking at overplays for this Patriots team basically moving forward because I can't see, as long as Gronk stays healthy, of course, I can't see anything slowing this offense down and this defense is not very good. I think they're very vulnerable and I think they're going to get points scored on them throughout the course of the season. That's a smart one. I would say through three weeks, Kansas City is the best team in the NFL. They're as balanced as I've ever seen a football team. And watching Andy Reid growing up when I was living in Philadelphia, this has all the makings of one of the best teams he's ever put out on the field. Justin Houston in the pass rush. Alex Smith finally taking shots down the field. Weapons abound in Kansas City. I think the Chiefs right now are the best team in football. I'd also look at Arizona and I'd say a big play against. Something's wrong with that team. The offense... The line can't block. They have no running game. Defensively, they're a little bit susceptible. They gave Dallas their best shot and still came up short on Monday. I think Bruce Arians in the front office are at odds and ends with one another. I wouldn't be surprised if Arians is not coaching that team next season. And finally, for me, I'm going to take a look at the Raiders basically from here on out. This team had so much hype and maybe the most hype of any team entering this season, but there are holes in this team. Derek Carr this past week played awful. And listen, Amari Cooper already dropped more balls this season than he did all of last season. I'm wondering if they're going to continue to be overvalued, Joe. And if that's the case, then we're just going to keep playing against them. We played against them this past week and it worked out for us. They can't play defense, and we finally saw that in week three. First two weeks were a mirage. This defense has major holes at cornerback. They can't cover tight ends. This has been a recurring theme for three or four years, and here's the biggest problem with the Raiders. Their willingness to throw the ball down the field. Look at where they rank in yards per attempt. Look at how many shots they take down the field. Very rare. Matt, we were watching that Tennessee game in week one together. How often did Derek Carr take a deep shot down the field? Very rare that these guys air it out, despite the fact that many consider them a state-of-the-art offense. Mm. Well, and then when they do air it out, they get picked off on the first offensive play of the game exactly. on Sunday night. So. 
All right, gentlemen, the first game that we're going to discuss is New Orleans and Miami. This is the London game this week. It is 9.30 in the East, 6.30 in the West. Miami coming off a very disappointing game to the Jets of all people. Meanwhile, the Saints are coming off a game where they beat up on the Panthers' defense, which up until that point had looked really solid. Matt, you're first on this one. How do you see this game going? Yeah, I mean, listen, Jay Cutler is Jay Cutler again. It doesn't matter what uniform he's wearing. It does not matter. If he has a new weapon around him, it does not matter at at all. As long as he's getting beat down, Jay Cutler is going to play like a guy that's getting beat down. When things are going well, Jay Cutler's all right. He's pretty decent. Things are going terrible, and Jay Cutler plays terrible. He plays down to how the game is going as opposed to actually fighting back, which is what a bunch of people have always said about Jay Cutler and why Jay Cutler has the horrible, basically the entire reputation of being this horrible guy in the locker room and everything like that. Joe, for me... I look at this Saints team who went on the road at Carolina, a place they have traditionally played terribly, and put it on a team. Granted, Cam Newton is not Cam Newton, but are we saying that Jay Cutler's better than Cam Newton? Are we saying, I mean... Let me just quickly interject here. This game opened at a pick'em looking at SBRodds.com. That's where we get all this information. Um, and now the money has come in on New Orleans. So two and a half point is what they're laying in some spots, three in other places. Joe, do you think that line moving towards New Orleans is the right play? I would stay away from the takeaway regarding Cam Newton versus the Saints. I think there's an angle there to worry about with the Panthers. For the Saints, the big takeaway is that they went on grass outdoors to Carolina against a good defense. And Matt, they tore them up. They tore them up in that game last week. I think you could see the same thing here against Miami. There's two angles I would look at. One, I've overlooked something with the Saints team. They cover spreads. They're eleven and five against the number over their last sixteen, and they're covering on grass as well. They're I believe they're five of and garbage one. time. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they, yeah, they five and make one up. over their last six on grass. So those two things I'll take into account. And I don't think Miami can possibly play that poorly. You have to have some level of pride to go to the Jets and get squadushed like that. You're going to bounce back this week. Over under forty nine. I'd lean to the total of going over in this game. All right, now on to the 1 p.m. games on the East Coast, the 10 a.m. games on the West Coast. All right, uh, may- maybe some recency bias here. Uh, Pittsburgh is uh, open at one and a half points. Now they're at two and a half, three in some spots over Baltimore. This is a 1 p.m. game as well. You know, Pittsburgh had that really disappointing performance against the Chicago Bears, but at the same time, you know, Baltimore got massacred by the by the by the Jaguars this past week. So, yeah, is this a game that you go? Okay, Pittsburgh should bounce back in this spot against a very questionable Baltimore Ravens team. Joe, you're first. The Ravens showed us something through the first two weeks of the season, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And then they went to London and they laid an egg and never got off the plane in that game. And you've got to wonder, is that a one game anomaly where Harbaugh rallies the troops and they show up for this rivalry game this week? Or is this a sign of things to come? It's tough to trust this Ravens team post Super Bowl victory. They've been 500 at best. They struggle throwing the ball down the field. Flacco has come nowhere near justifying that contract. But the Pittsburgh Steelers are off. This offense, Le'Veon Bell, something's wrong with them. And not only that, you can see there's some strife regarding the national anthem situation with this team. They were all going to stay in the locker room. Then Villanueva, the offensive lineman who served three tours in Afghanistan, comes out and, 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 and puts his hand over his heart. And then Roethlisberger releases this statement because clearly Pittsburgh is not a town that's very fond of anthem protests. That's not a place where that's going to go over too kindly. So Roethlisberger realizes this is a PR hit for him. He claims that there's a lot of confusion in the locker room. Um, he's pro-unity, but he's also pro flag. It just seems like a disorganized team. Mike Tomlin did not have them ready to play. So right now I lean Baltimore, shockingly enough, but I don't love the game. These are two teams I have yet to put my finger on through three weeks this season, uh, you, Matt. Right there, that last two sentences is exactly where I am. This is a game that I want to stay away from at all costs right here. Pittsburgh has basically been the backward team for me. I thought it was going to be the easily the best offense in all of the NFL and the defense was going to be shaky. Actually, the defense has played great. The defense has been wonderful and the offense has been absolutely horrible. Then you see this like you're talking about. Then you see with Baltimore, a very solid defense for the first couple, first few weeks and then they go over there and then absolutely horrible. So for me, I don't know this uh, Jekyll and Hyde situation that's going on right here whatsoever. I'm going to stay far, far, far away from this game. Would not surprise me, Joe, if either team won by two touchdowns. And when I feel that way about a game, that's whenever I say, you know what, I'll, I'll let everyone else take that game. You should play alternative lines on both sides. There's probably a way you can get good plus money on <laughs> right, that. Right, right. All right, so New England and Carolina, also a 1 p.m. game. Uh, the Patriots 
Patriots are eight point favorites at opening, and since then it's moved to nine, ten and a half in some places. And look, we've we've all sat here numerous times on this show and talked about how questionable uh, Cam Newton is looking. We know that Greg Olson is down and out, and he's going to be for several more weeks. Is this a spot where the true colors of the Patriots come out, or excuse me, of the Panthers come out, and they just start to collapse, or does the defense rebound after a very embarrassing performance against the the the, um, the Saints last week, Matt? Yeah, I mean, look at, at five dimes. This is already up to ten and a half. If you go to sbards.com, you can see and you can compare the different books here. It is at nine still at a lot of other places. Joe, for me, nine is a great, great number, and I'll tell you why. The one thing we mentioned about the Patriots just a second ago is they do have a shaky defense and teams with any sort of offense are going to score on them. That said, this Carolina team has no sort of offense whatsoever. With Greg Olson going down and Kelvin Benjamin now at least going to be battling an injury. Now, whether he plays or not, again, keep keep an eye on that, monitor that situation. He got his leg bent back. It wasn't any str- actual structural damage, but he might sit this week. So then what? Your number one receiver is Devin Funches? Devin, you're going to rely on Devin Funches? No, it's going to be... 10 dump offs to Christian McCaffrey out of the backfield. And that's not going to be enough to beat the Patriots team here. Cam Newton's not going to run because again, he's, we, he did run for a touchdown this past week for the first time in basically a year, but uh, that's not going to be a regular occurrence there. There's no set runs for him. Like we used to see in the past. I think this Carolina team is in for a rude, rude, rude awakening when they head to Foxborough here. I love new England in this game. I've already bet them. Fortunately, I was able to get it when the line came out at eight. I was sitting right on top of that. Um, Fortunately, I got it there, but even at nine, I still think it's a pretty strong play. This line move is all about teaser protection. You open this game eight, you can six point tease it down to two with New England. Now they've got it up at nine and 10 because they don't want you to be able to th- tease through the key number of three. So it's going to sit you on three or it's going to sit you on four, depending on whether or not the line's sitting 10. I hate laying this many points in any situation, but there's got to be a way to bet this game based on what we've seen from Carolina. So If you break down the math and you take a nine-point spread and a total of 48, you've got New England winning, what, 29-20? That's what they're telling you? I'll play over the team total. I'll play New England to hang 29, 30 points, 31 points in this game because last week we saw the Saints just run roughshod over this Carolina defense, and it feels like Carolina's already letting their season get away from them despite the fact that they're 2-1. and Cam Newton can't keep up with this as incendiary as this Patriot offense has looked through three weeks, especially the last two. I'll play over on the Patriot team total. So l- let me ask you this with uh, with the Patriots specifically, Joe, do, y- do you think this is the point where they they really start to get it together after a pretty shaky start through throughout three weeks? They're going to be solid and well-coached and well-quarterbacked virtually no matter what. You'll have those rare blips from Brady. The defense is what you want to study on this team moving forward. You want to study them every chance you get because you want to monitor the Dante Hightower injury. And when he's out of the lineup, you see the jump in yards per carry and yards per attempt from the passing side of the equation. So how is Bill Belichick going to counter that loss? How is this defense going to improve without Dante Hightower? I would say if you're going to study anything about the Patriots, we know about Brady, we know about the offense. Watch the defense, learn the defense. That's going to be the key for us handicapping the Pats moving forward. Yeah, and Joe, one of the things that'll be interesting from a player prop perspective in this game is what they, whenever they come out, is what the catch total for Christian McCaffrey is going to be. If it's, man, six and a half, even seven and a half, I'm taking it over all day long. I mean, that's it's going to be the only option there. It's going to, all they're going to be able to do is dump the ball off to Christian McCaffrey. I mean, I think I might even take the over if it was eight and a half. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I think this is what going to be. What did he have last week? He had nine, right? I think he had 10. I, I, 10 on 11 targets or something or something, something crazy like that. So for me, and especially with the Benjamin stuff, if Benjamin is out or if he's going to be severely limited, this is going to run through Christian McCaffrey. So I would certainly look at whatever the reception total is for him. Tennessee and Houston. This started out with Tennessee being favored by one and a half. In some spots, it's now a pick In other spots, Tennessee is laying two points. Uh, interesting game here, um, considering how this line is moving. And um, I think it opened up a little bit light on Tennessee. I actually expected them to open up a little bit more of a, of a favorite than they did. But Matt, do you think that's an accurate line to start with at Tennessee minus one and a half? Or how do you feel about this game? This is a weird situation because I don't know what I'm missing here. Because if I were, like, I, I always look at these games and before I look at the the totals that I mean the the spreads that are out there I try to handicap them myself and where I would have it and like I would have had 
Tennessee at three points in this game. So I don't know what I'm missing here. I don't know why it is only a point and a half, maybe two points at some other places out there. I really like what I've seen in this Tennessee team, to be perfectly honest. And listen, Deshaun Watson's been okay. He's been okay, but he's going to make a ton of mistakes. Tennessee defense about middle of the road, but you only got to be middle of the road against a rookie quarterback that's going to make a bunch of mistakes. The one thing I guess to monitor here, Joe, is Will Fuller, if you guys remember from last year, the burner there for the Texans might be back this week. He practiced at the end of last week. He's trying to work himself back in here. If that's the case, that's going to open up some options for DeAndre Hopkins. And if that's the case, then maybe this Houston offense can start to get some sort of rhythm going there, some sort of something. I'm going to wait on some injury news here before I would make a play for sure. But my first instinct certainly leans to Tennessee here. If Houston head coach Bill O'Brien didn't botch his game management late in the fourth quarter against the Patriots, Deshaun Watson would be 2-0 and as an NFL quarterback. He'd be 2-0 and right now. He's coming into his own. You saw a big jump in progression from the Cincinnati Thursday night game until the game against New England. Now, he still has a lot of learning to do, but I look at this total at 44, and I think to myself, what am I missing here? Right. What am I missing here? Tennessee rolled it up against Seattle last week, and I think Tennessee's going to have enough offense to put points up against this Houston defense. Meanwhile, I think Tennessee's going to have a hell of a time trying to chase Watson all over the field. You throw Will Fuller into the mix, you've got to like Houston's offense to put up even more points in that scenario. So nothing much on the side here for me. Um Maybe a slight lean to Houston based on the fact that they're laying less than three as a home team, but I'd play over 44 points here. Detroit and Minnesota is not on the board yet. As of now, we don't know who is going to be under center for Minnesota. That obviously changes things dramatically. Uh, there was some rumblings today that I saw coming out of the Vikings camp that they are going to make an effort for Sam Bradford to play this week, but he did not practice again on Wednesday. So what exactly does that mean? We just don't know because it's not on the board. We won't discuss it, but I will say th- this much. I was very impressed with Case Keenum when he had a full week to prepare um, at home, especially. I thought that he looked great, obviously, under center, had a huge week yeah. at quarterback from Minnesota, so I don't think it's a huge downgrade, even if Case Keenum is playing quarterback. Uh, I think it's a huge, I mean, I definitely think it's a, a pretty big downgrade, but that being said, it's not like we're throwing some guy in there that doesn't have any experience, right? I mean, the guy started a bunch of games in the NFL, so this is not like this is something crazy and actually has some talent around him as opposed to last year. I mean, this is a guy that has Stefan Diggs, who, by the way, is lighting the world on fire, even with Case Keenum under yep. center right now. Dalvin Cook looking every bit like Adam the Thielen player is that, looking we, great. that we thought he was yep. going to be. Now, Rudolph, I mean, sure. listen, this is this is a lot of weapons for them right here in this game. So I don't know where this would... I, I don't know exactly, Joe, where this would open. Like, I'm, t- I'm trying to think in well, my let, head... Let, let's talk about what you just said before the line goes up. Yeah. How would you guys handicap this? Let's say Sam Bradford is not going to go. Case Keenum's under center. How, how do you handicap this? I mean, point and a half Minnesota, Joe, what do you think? Something like that? Minnesota two and a half. I wouldn't give them the full home field advantage. Although Minnesota, this is going to be an interesting split team this year. You can already see it developing at home. They play a very solid brand of football. I expect that to continue on the road, a completely different story. Now, maybe we chalk that up to Case Keenum start in Pittsburgh last week, but Minnesota is one of those teams. I'm going to circle and say, Hmm, as a home club this year, I think they found a way to create some very nice home field advantage with that new stadium up there in Minnesota. Now, Now, the concern for me with Detroit, how does this team respond after the way they lost that game last week? Detroit is always finding new and innovative ways to lose football games. That was a first. Anywhere in the NFL, a 10-second runoff to lose the game, no guarantee they get in on fourth down, but they should be 3-0 and right now. They have to be kicking themselves that they don't have the edge over the Green Bay Packers at this point in time. So I'm not sure what to expect from this Detroit team just yet. Buffalo and Atlanta is next. Buffalo had themselves a performance against the Denver Broncos at home last week. This week, they're traveling to Atlanta. We know that Atlanta's very fast at home and in the Dome. Matt, how do you see this one? Because Atlanta, big favorites, opened at 7.5. Now they're laying 9.5 in some it's, places. I mean, look at these lines all yeah. over the place. This is crazy. Pinnacle is at 8, 9.5 at 5 dimes, and you can still get it at 7.5 at a couple of other books. Bookmaker, Again, yeah. Yeah, teaser I mean, just, protection. All about yeah. teaser protection right there. Yeah, just head on over, like we said, to SBR odds. You can, like, you, you basically look at these and go, wow, I can't believe there's all these options, which is why we mentioned before, Dave, you got to have a couple of different accounts at places because whenever you have a couple of different accounts, you can shop the best lines. And, and by the way, again, all these odds that you're talking about, sbrodds.com, uh, you probably know that, but just in case you don't, you can see these odds updating in real time, enormously valuable. Tool. So Joe, when I first saw this game, even when it was at, even when it was at seven and a half, and especially whenever I see it at nine and a half, 
I thought Buffalo was pretty live in this situation. Here's the thing. This team's pretty scrappy, right? I mean, you've got like Tyrod Taylor, who everybody undervalues every single year, but he's just a solid dude. He doesn't turn the ball over. He doesn't fumble. He doesn't throw interceptions. You've got at least enough talent there. I mean, Sean McCoy might lead this team in receptions, actually. He's become such a valuable guy out of the backfield for them there. If they can finally start to get something out of Zay Jones, obviously Charles Clay is a big target for him there as well. That's a lot of points with this Buffalo team, especially nine and a half at five dimes. I mean, it seems to me like I would easily head over on the Buffalo side at nine and a half. I don't know what what you feel about this Buffalo team, but I feel like we talked about them that they were going to be pre-tanking this year, but this team's been playing, man. They've been scrappy. I like what I've seen from these guys. They have, but you have to wonder if they're going to have some sort of hangover effect after that big upset over Denver last week. That's a huge win for a team like this, and you know they enjoyed it. Now they're going to turn around, and they're going to go from Rouse Wilson, where they enjoy one of the more underrated home field advantages Mm -hmm. in football. They're going to turn around, and they're going to head down to the Dome, and they're going to play a non-conference opponent in a really bad spot, and that's a Dome team in Atlanta playing at home, sitting 3-0 and right now. This is a tease for me. I don't care if I can't get it through three. I'll take Atlanta on the tease. I figure they're going to win convincingly. The one reason I'm not going to lay the full amount with Atlanta, they're a couple plays away from being one and two on the season. They could have lost that game to the Bears. They should have lost the game last week to the Lions. They sit three and oh, and they're the defending NFC champs. So we give them a lot of credit, but I just can't help but think if a couple plays break against them, just a couple, they're sitting at one and two right now. And this is a dramatically different line. So there are some concerns, but I don't see Buffalo holding their own in this one. This is too big a step up in class. 10 in the East, one in the West, excuse me, flip that one uh, on the East and 10 in the West, uh, the Rams in Dallas. And, and this one is, um, you know, a line that opened with Dallas laying eight and a half, and now they're being pushed down to six in some places, seven in other spots, but six is where we're seeing most of that uh, action right now. It's, it's coming in on the Rams. So, Joe, do you think that's an accurate line with Dallas now at just six points being favorites going up against the Rams? Great situation for the Rams. Ten days to get ready for this game, so you're rested. You're feeling good after that win against the Niners. You're 2-1, and one, and this is your first really big test this season against the Dallas Cowboys. Conversely, the Cowboys are coming off a marquee Monday night win. It's a short week to get ready for this game. The Rams could be a team you overlook. When we talk about the Cowboys, the first thing we talk about is the offensive line and how dominant they are. When you go against someone like Aaron Donald, the offensive line is neutralized just a bit. This is a massive line move. If you're seeing a line move from eight to six and it goes right through that key number of seven, that is extraordinarily alarming in this game. I'd like the Rams. I take the pick. It just feels like that is so drastic a move so early in the week. I lean to the Rams here, Matt. Yeah, I actually don't really like a side in this game more than I like the under in this game. And listen, I know I'm moving. I know I'm taking a position against where the early money is coming in right here. But sometimes I think you just take a stand on the way you believe that a game's going to play out and how you think the most likely scenario is. And I'm going to take a stand on this game. Joe, where does the strength lie for Dallas in their run game in Ezekiel Elliott? Where does the strength lie for LA Rams? It's going to be through Todd Gurley. If you look at this right now as well, the Rams giving up the fourth most rush yards per game at 139 a game. So if you're the Dallas Cowboys, are you going to scheme around passing the ball or are you going to look at running the ball with Ezekiel Elliott, who's your workhorse with the strength of your team in that offensive line and keep the ball on the ground and exploit what seems to be the Rams' weakness to this point right now? I think that's the way this plays. I think Gurley gets a ton of carries, and as long as you run the ball, the clock keeps running, the clock keeps ticking. Can't see this game in any way, shape, or form turning into a shootout. So for me, I like the under here, and I know, again, like I said, I know I'm going against where this line movement is going, but I play out this game in my head, and I see no way this turns into a shootout. I see a lot of Ezekiel Elliott. I see a ton of Todd Gurley, and I like the under here. It's the battle for Ohio, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. This one opened up with Cincinnati laying two and a half since then. It has jumped in their favor. Three in a lot of places, three and a half in others. Joe, you're up first on this one. Do you think that Cincinnati is going to come off that disappointing uh, win against the Green Bay Packers where they actually got some offense going and they looked like they they were doing great in the first half of that football game and then they just let it slip away? Or do you think this is one of those spots where Cleveland is at home going to be able to show Cincinnati to be the pretty bad team that they actually are? Cleveland is clearly not trying to win. The first time you're a road favorite since 2014, you go to Indianapolis and you get shellacked. Don't look at the final score. They were getting blown out in that game. Now they're going to come home and what? 
with this baseball front office, they're all of a sudden going to decide they want to win football games. This is the design for the Cleveland Browns. We sit here and talk about teams like the Jets tanking. Cleveland perfected the tank because you don't even think they're doing it. You think they're moderately increasing their talent level and getting better every week. They just went and got worked by a really bad Indianapolis team. Meanwhile, the idiot Jets go out and win a football game and drop five or six positions in the draft. Cleveland is not going to try to win this game. Paul DePodesta, the former front office baseball man, is there trying to make sure it's about value. They're trying to get high picks. I would go with Cincinnati here. I don't even know if that was disappointing for them last week. They know they suck. The fact that they got a lead in Green Bay, they're probably popping bottles over that. Listen, (laughs) this is a touchdown. Yeah, we got a lead on the road, man. We got this. Less than five interceptions. I mean, this seems like a this seems like a slam dunk play for me right here. I think we're looking at a lot of recency bias right here. This is one of those situations where you look and you go, oh, this team is not very good because of their record in Cincinnati and now they're going to be on the road and yada, yada, yada. But like you said, Joe, this this Cleveland team is built to win two to three years from now. They're not built to win this year. They are playing young guys all over the place. They do not have any sort of veteran leadership on this team whatsoever. And this is the type of game that you lose. You lose a game to Andy Dalton and AJ Green. And now it with the featuring of Joe Mixon, finally, who's by far the most talented running back in that backfield there for Cincinnati. This is the perfect opportunity for this to be a, a ugly, ugly, ugly game. Now, listen, Deshaun Kaiser, worst quarterback rating in the league so far. I think he's going to be serviceable for a little while. But again, a guy that's going to turn over the ball a lot, a guy that's going to take a lot of sacks because he likes to scramble and scramble. It's it's a, another one of the misnomers that people people don't really get. Because a guy's mobile, they actually take more sacks because they hold on to the ball longer and they try to make things happen and they actually take more sacks. Well, when you take more sacks, there's more chances for turnovers, strip sacks, different things like that. For me, this seems like Bengals all day long. You can already see the line moving there, opening at two and a half, has moved a full point at three or four different books. If you can get this, if you want this side, I would suggest getting it now because I think this line could move even more, Joe. The Bengals have covered each of the last five games against the Browns. The trend continues this weekend. There's not a whole lot else to say about it. Jacksonville and the Jets. Jacksonville opens laying three and a half, and that has actually come down in a couple of places where they're laying three. Otherwise, it stayed mostly flat. Joe, you're up first on this one. Jacksonville has been has, has burned me a couple of times this year. Thirty nine and a half total here. I mean, like <laughs> it's so- like it's like they have no confidence whatsoever in either one of these teams. It's unbelievable. Yeah. All right. What do, what do you think, Joe? Every year, and I think anyone who bets sports has this happen to them, every year there's that one team that no matter which way you play them, you always get it wrong. When you're on them, they stuck. When you're against them, they look great. When you bet the over, they're on the under. When you bet the under, they're on the over. It happens every single year. Boise State is just killing me Mm -hmm. in college football this season. I have a feeling that could be the Jags. Dave, you already hinted at that, so maybe we just stay the hell away from this team all year. But I can't help but think, huh, The Jags are laying a lot of points on the road in New York against a Jets team that has a little bit of hype coming off that win over Miami. Do we really trust Blake Bortles to string it together? Dude, McCown's played great. McCown has actually played pretty good for what he's got around him. I mean, the guy's managing the game fairly well with a bunch of reject wide receivers that nobody wants. To answer your question, though, Joe, no, we don't trust Blake Bortles to do anything right. He has screwed up everything so far this season. And yes, they went out there and they put up 44 points last week against Baltimore. However, that doesn't change anything. Like you said, there's no it's, way that I'm going to continue to invest <laughs> in the idea that Blake Bortles is, is going to meet no matter what the expectation is. No, it's a well, and plus it's a different quarterback. Remember that, that, that was Sir Blake Bortles that was it's playing over there. And very, this is just, this is just normal. Blake. Point. You've been nice. Yeah, sir. this is just normal. Blake Bortles is going to be going on here. Joe, Welcome this back is, to America where we do not respect you. Yeah, Joe, I'm, I'm with you here, man. This is I mean, look, we have implied team totals here of 21 and a half points for the Jags and 18 points for the Jets. I mean, they think this is going to be just a disgustingly ugly, terrible game right here. I don't like the reason. This is another reason why you don't bet these games because you hate yourself as you're watching them. Like, cause every single yeah, thing, I can't that, watch this. like every single thing, the last time on, you said that it was, it was the Rams and the 49ers. And the whole time I was sitting there, I'm like, I love myself for watching this game. There's nothing but offense. 80 points. It's a beautiful game. Yeah, that actually was one of the, but, but there, there, I will go out on a limb and say there's no way this game is a great game. This this game is... <laughs> this, is this is not an 80-pointer. There is no way this game is going to be a great game. I have no play here. I have no lean here. I don't like... Like, the total seems about right. I mean, 40 points between two terrible offenses and a defense is pretty good. I mean, every everything seems on to me. And so when everything seems on to me, I think it's better for just... Uh, let's invest elsewhere, right, Joe? 
I would say let's invest our money elsewhere, <laughs> our time elsewhere, our efforts and our yeah. research. Dave, you said it perfectly coming out. And that's the end of it. I'm not investing in or again on or against this team the rest of the way. I'm going to get it all wrong. I would go 0 for 16 betting Jaguar games this year. All right, let's jump into the afternoon games. All right, our first game on the later slate is the Giants and the Bucks. This one open with the Bucks being favored at four. Since then, the money has moved a little bit in the favor of the Giants. Now, Tampa Bay is laying three. Joe, the, the Giants have been very disappointing so far this season, but are people just discounting them too much at this point? How are we supposed to get behind this Giant team? What have they shown you that would make you think they are going to compete in this football game? Offensively, they are a wreck. They cannot protect, and they are on pace for a historically pathetic rushing attack. They've become a very one-dimensional offense, and that one dimension is Odell Beckham. And if you're Tampa Bay and you saw what happened in the Philadelphia game last week, you can't help but say, we're going to press Beckham at the line, and we're going to roll a safety right over the top to double him. You're going to have to beat us another way. On the flip side, the Bucs struggled in week two, or I should say week three, excuse me, in Minnesota against the Vikings. They did play fairly decent football in week two at home against the Bears. The one thing that concerns me in that Bears game, it was the turnovers that were the difference because the box score had them at virtually identical yardage. So I would lean to the Buccaneers here. I'm not thrilled with that team so far this season, but playing at home against a giant team that just looks like dead meat, it's tough to get behind Eli Manning at any point right now. Yeah, I mean, listen, at home with just a field goal here to cover, I think this is a pretty good spot for Tampa Bay right here. Joe, the New York football giants are giving up 153 yards a game on the ground right here. So again, it's insane. when prop bet time comes out, see what that number is for Jaquiz Rogers, because I imagine it's going to be nowhere near 153. I imagine it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 something. And if that's the case, maybe that is a wonderful, wonderful over because what we've seen with Jaquiz Rogers before when he's made these spot starts for Doug Martin, they will run him into the ground because they know that it doesn't matter. Like they'll give him 30 carries in a game because they understand Doug Martin is actually their guy. So they don't care if they run down to quiz Rogers here. So I could see him getting a ton of action in this game. Just something to keep in mind when the props come out. I like you cannot back this Giants team. They're going to find ways to lose games. They are not playing inspired football. And like you mentioned, the big, big thing here is they cannot run the football a lick. And if they can't run the football a lick, they're just going to, if I, if you're the, if you are Tampa Bay right here, you are honing in on that pass defense as hard as you possibly can this week to prevent Odell Beckham from going crazy. Listen, if one of these other guys beats you and you lose to one of these other guys, fine, right? You just don't let Odell Beckham beat you this week. I think they take him out of the equation here. I like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a lot this week. Moving on to the next game, we've got Philadelphia Eagles going up against the L.A. Chargers, and the L.A. Chargers, another one of these teams that has been very, very disappointing so far this season. They've opened up at 0-3. Joe, you're up first on this one. Can Philadelphia find it to travel to the West Coast, take on the Chargers, and beat them at home? Philadelphia is a strong football team, really strong, but this is a point spread where they're not getting any benefit of the doubt whatsoever. There is no value in taking the Eagles here. That doesn't mean they cover, but at some point you've got to figure the Chargers put it all together and find a way to win a game. Not saying that's going to happen this week by any stretch, but you take Jason Verrett, the best corner on the Los Angeles' roster out of the equation due to an injury, and that defense gets even worse for Carson Wentz to pick apart moving forward here. The Chargers find ways to lose football games. That's it. That's really the only thing you can say about them. They find ways to lose football games. And teams that find ways to lose, it's hard to put your money down on them to win, especially when you have a spread this tight. So I don't like the value in Philly, but if I'm playing it, I'm playing Philly. Yeah, and the Chargers open at minus one. Since then, it's moved to a pick them in some places. Other places, uh, they're laying one and a half points. So there's, there is there is some some variance in where this line is moving currently. Yeah, I like to feel that I'm smart enough to know when I'm stupid about something, and I am very stupid about this Chargers team so far this year through three weeks I've not been able to figure out what's going on there and until further notice it's kind of one of those teams that I've moved off of my off of the board that I'm going to play like I just can't figure out how this team with all of this talent with a with the the defensive line that they've got is finding ways to lose these games so until I see something further and listen we're only three weeks into this season this is another thing teaching moment right here, Joe, just a little bit of a teaching moment, is you don't have to play every game, you don't have to play every team, and if you don't like a team, then by all means, take a couple weeks and see if you can evaluate and figure out this team a little bit better, and that's what I'm going to do with this Chargers team, because I thought I had a pretty good idea of what we were going to get with this team. 
Not so much the case. Also, Melvin Gordon, while if you're playing him in fantasy, you love him because he's catching some passes and scoring touchdowns. He's been incredibly inefficient, and that is eventually going to come back and haunt this Chargers team, averaging a tiny, tiny yards per carry average so far. And so for me, got to be a got to be a team that I'm just going to take a wait and see on here. All right, two more late afternoon games on Sunday. It is San Francisco 49ers going up against the Arizona Cardinals. Arizona, once again, going to be playing at home. Uh, the line opened up with Arizona laying six and has since moved to them um, at laying seven in most places, six and a half in others. But, Joe, do you think that Arizona can actually complete a game against San Francisco where they looked like that team that they did in the first quarter and a half against the Dallas Cowboys? No, and I like San Francisco plus the points. I think San Francisco has a very good shot to win this game outright. Look at your situation here. The Niners have 10 days to get ready for this game, and they're coming off their best offensive performance of the season against the Los Angeles Rams on Thursday night. That's got to inspire them somewhat on that side of the football. So they're going to travel to Arizona, where they're 8-3 and three against the spread over their last 11 visits, to take on a Cardinal team that, A, just left it all on the line against the Dallas Cowboys on Monday night and lost. And I mean lost. They had a great first quarter when it was scripted, but then it all fell apart after that. B, they're working on a short week, and C, it's very easy to overlook the 49ers in this situation because they are not a good football team. I think San, I think Arizona is going through a little bit of self-loathing right now. I wouldn't be surprised if Bruce Arians is not back with this club next season. I think there are some problems between the front office and the coaching staff. There's a disconnect over how they went about the NFL draft in the first round. Arians wanted a quarterback. He ended up getting a linebacker. And Reddick's a good linebacker out of Temple. But he ain't a quarterback, and that's what Arians is pissed about. He managed the game very poorly. I'm taking the points with San Francisco. I think you might get your upset special of the week right here. All right, then. So let's talk through this. If you think that San Francisco could win this game, how many points are they going to have to score to win this game? Because I can only assume with that defense, you don't think that Arizona is going to get shut down completely going up against this 49ers defense, at, uh, going up against them at home. So you tell me, how many points is San Francisco going to have to score to win this game? 20. So I think you, 20 points can win it. So you think they could win you think they could win a 20 to 17 game. You think that the, that this Arizona team's only going to score 17 points. I said I think they could win that. I think they could win it like that. Yeah, San Francisco's defense in week one did a decent job limiting Cam Newton, who we've seen turn out to not be that solid. And again, they limited Seattle in Seattle, who's turned out to not be that solid. The Rams got him good in that Thursday night game. They really did, but you're going to make defensive adjustments based on what they saw. And with that offensive line. Remember, this is a very one-dimensional attack. The Rams ran Todd Gurley down their throat, and Jared Goff has taken a big step forward. Arizona can't run the football. David Johnson's hurt. The offensive line was getting blown off the ball. It's Carson Palmer or nothing. If you double up Larry Fitzgerald, you really don't have too many elements of the game that can sting you on Arizona's offense. Yeah, so basically where I was just talking you through into basically talking you on to several other bets then, because... The, the under, right? The, well, the implied team total here for the 49ers is 18.75 points. The implied total for the Cardinals here is 25.75 points. So these are obviously two bets. If you think San Francisco is going to score or or going to need 20 to win, you think that they could upset right here. You're obviously going to play the money line. You're going to play the San Francisco team total over. You're going to play the Arizona team total under. There's all kinds of bets here then if you think that this could be the upset special of the week. That's all I was where I was going with this is talking you on to additional bets here, Joe. Yeah, because I don't already have a problem with too many (laughs) wagers on a Sunday afternoon. Just, to, just, just, just keep it in mind that all these make sense. <laughs> then, if that's how you can see the game playing out, then all these other bets make sense, right? That's a DGen special. If I find myself with nine wagers on the Niner Cardinal game in the afternoon, <laughs> don't judge. All right, <laughs> finally for the late afternoon game on Sunday, this is an interesting one. Oakland traveling to Denver to take on the Broncos at Mile High opens as a pick'em. Since then, Denver's getting the money. They're laying three in some spots, two and a half in others. Joe, is this one of these? It, it's a divisional game. It's an important game for both of these teams. Both teams went out last week and did not have good performances. The Broncos against the Bills and the Raiders against the Redskins. What do you what do you see happening in this game? And who actually emerges as a contender in the uh, in the AFC West when this one's all said and done? 
I think it's important what you noted in that both teams are coming off a loss. Both are disappointing losses. The Raiders looked horrible Sunday night in Washington, and the Broncos got upset in a big way at Buffalo. So you've got two focused football teams coming back to Denver, knowing full well the loser of this game is has a very good chance of being more than two games back at Kansas City after just four weeks of play. That's not a good spot to be in. So you're going to have a lot of focus. I see the total opening at 47 and then ticking down to about 46 and a half, and that intrigues me for a couple reasons. At altitude, the Raiders might wear down a little bit late in this game. But more importantly, Michael Crabtree and Amari Cooper have problems with separation. And this offense does not like to throw the ball down the field. You saw what happened the last time these two got together. Aqib Tlaib literally snatched the gold chain off Michael Crabtree's neck. Crabtree's banged up. We don't even know if he's going to play in this game. Suffered a chest injury on a big hit uh, against Washington Sunday night. Amari Cooper has been a mess. And against Chris Harris or Tlaib, they're going to get very physical with him. I don't think the Raiders are going to be able to move the football with the frequency we saw in the first two weeks of the season. So you try to grind it out with Marshawn Lynch, but the Bronco defense is going to get up for this game. It's going to be slim pickings for the Raider offense. Flip side, Raider defense has had some success in Denver in the past. Two years ago was the game where Khalil Mack had like six sacks against the Denver offense. I'm looking under here because I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of explosive play on either side of the ball. I like Denver in this game. I don't. I think Denver wins this game. Like you said, you cannot pass on this team. I mean, this is they call it the no fly zone, and so far this year they have actually lived up to that. You can't pass on this team. And and listen. They haven't been able to pass very efficiently for in Oakland right now anyway. And so I don't see a path to success here for the Oakland Raiders. I believe, like you said, I think they're going to lean very, very heavily on Marshawn Lynch. But at the same time, we've seen that strategy get really eaten up there in Denver as well by this defense. So for me, and plus, look, you're, you're talking about two and a half points at some of these places. So, I mean, you don't, you're not even, it's not even a field goal, right? Like uh, inner tops right now, if you look over at SBR odds, uh, just bet is two and a half, uh, five dimes is two and a half. So less than a field goal in a place at altitude, like you mentioned, where you can kick a field goal from like 97 yards out. I mean, even if this game is tight, the Broncos get the possession to end the game here. They make a 57 yard field goal and win the game. And then you cover for me, I like Denver to win. I like them to cover the two and a half. The three, you might be looking at a push here, but if you can find two and a half, love, love, love that. On to our night games of the week. 8.30 in the East, 5.30 in the West. Indianapolis and Seattle is what we get on Sunday night. Of course, Seattle is a huge favorite coming into this one, laying 11 and a half points at the time the line opened, and now it's jumped to 13, 14 in other places. That's the biggest is 14 that I'm seeing over on five dimes as we tape this show. Are, are the Seattle Seahawks going to win by a couple of touchdowns in this game? Matt, what do you think? Tell me how. I mean, seriously, tell tell me how here. I understand that Russell Wilson kind of rebounded this past week and everything like that, but I mean, he was forced into that. I mean, this was this was a, that was the only way that they were going to be able to move the ball. Two touchdowns. I understand the Colts are a bad team. I get it. But Jacoby Brissett has actually shown a bit of life. He is actually putting up some fairly decent stats, to be perfectly honest with you, whenever you compare him to the other quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Joe, for me, I don't care. I understand it's a huge, huge, huge home field advantage playing in Seattle, maybe the biggest outside of Kansas City in all of the NFL. But for me, I can't bring myself to to two touchdowns for this Seattle team that I've seen Russell Wilson running for his life every single week, not having a run game whatsoever to rely on. I, I just can't, I cannot lay two touches. It's impossible. I think it was 2012 because I've only been the CenturyLink field in Seattle once. And I went there, I believe it was 2012. It was week two. The 49ers were in town to play the Seahawks. It was the year the Seahawks went on to win the Super Bowl. And I only needed about five minutes into the first quarter to hear that crowd noise to understand that I would never bet against that team at home during a primetime game. Doesn't mean I'm going to bet on them, but I'm sure as hell not betting against the Seahawks at home in prime time. That place is hell for opposing quarterbacks and offenses. I don't see any way the Colts get anything going in this game. The question is whether or not this lousy Seattle offense can get anything going. This is reminiscent of the 49er game from a couple weeks ago. Yep. Ugly, low scoring. 49ers have a better defense than the Colts, so I could see this game if they cover being like 17-3. I'm going to play the under in this game this week. I think it's the best way to play it. I see Jacoby Brissett and the Colt offense coming nowhere near 13 or 14 points in this game, and I really don't see how Russell Wilson and the Seahawks are going to hang 28 unless the special teams or the defense get involved in that. Yeah, Joe, you talk about six-point teasers a lot. I mean, maybe this is kind of one of those opportunities. If you get it from 13 down to a touchdown at 7, and then it 
bumps it all the way to 47 and a half for the for the under that that maybe be, might be something to look at right there because what you know, would you be more comfortable with getting 19 with the with the Colts <laughs> or teasing it down to like seven with the Seahawks wow that is a very that is a very very good question honestly I think I, the only way that I see this game getting out of hand would be in the Seattle side, obviously. So, I mean, I could see them completely going going crazy and winning by 28 points or something like that. So, for me, I probably would feel more comfortable just laying the touchdown. So, I mean, maybe maybe we look at it from that aspect as opposed to, okay, 13's a lot, but 7's a lot. Uh, I can, I can uh, ingest that a lot better. And then 41.5, getting up to 47.5, I can feel pretty good about that being an under as well. Moving on to the Monday night game. This could be an interesting one. Washington's coming off of a big performance against the Oakland Raiders last Sunday night. So they do have an extra day, obviously, to rest up here. And Kansas City, I think we can all agree, looks like the best football team in the NFL through three games. Uh, Kansas City is laying seven points. That's where it opened up. And it's come down a little bit in some spots. Six and a half over on Pinnacle. uh, Six and a half over on Heritage. But otherwise, it stayed pretty even. Joe, you're first on this one. I'm going to lay it. I'm going to lay it, and I'm going to close out a lot of six-point teasers with Mm -hmm. the Chiefs. Monday night at Arrowhead. Do you remember what happened Monday night at Arrowhead? Tom Brady a few years ago, they wrecked him. And that Chief team wasn't as good as this one. And that Patriot team went on to win the Super Bowl. This is Kirk Cousins and the Redskins. Nice game against the Oakland Raiders on Sunday night. You deserve a lot of credit for that. But this is an entirely different beast. On the road, non-conference, the place is going to be extraordinarily hostile. The fans in Kansas City know they have something special here. I think this is a straight-up ass-kicking, pillar to post, first quarter to fourth, first quarter to fourth. I'm taking Kansas City in this game. I think they're going to hammer Washington. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of you know square money come in on Washington because, like you mentioned, Joe, Kirk Cousins looked fantastic in a island game where everybody was watching and everybody was paying attention to what was going on and that influences stuff it influences if you don't think it does it does because everybody's tuned into the exact same game and they saw what you saw and everyone's like wow Kirk Cousins look great and everything's looking wonderful it was a home game it was against a Raiders team in a bad spot that you and I called that it was a bad spot for that team it was just not going to work out in their favor in that game and Derek Carr played like complete garbage which gave Kirk Cousins more opportunity to, to really show off what he could do and this Washington team to show off what they could do now they travel on the road, like you said, prime time at Arrowhead. No way, shape, or form is any any way in the world are they going to win this game. Kansas City all day for me. All right, now we're on to college games, and we'll do a quick little touch on the Thursday night matchup for you as well. All right, when it comes to college plays for Saturday, Matt, Joe, you guys have spent time discussing on this already. Joe, you've got a play for us in the college world for Saturday. What is it? We've got three of them actually for you, Dave. We put the minds together this week and we're going to throw them out right now. Game number one is our upset special of the week. It's Friday night, Washington State at home hosting USC. The Cougars are getting three and a half points. Great situation here as USC two weeks ago needed overtime at home to get past Texas. That's a lot of snaps for the defense. Last week, the Trojans traveled to Berkeley to take on a much improved California team under Justin Wilcox. What ends up happening? The game goes a lot tougher than USC expects. And again, a lot more snaps than anticipated for the USC defense. Now on a short week, you got to travel north, under the lights, hostile environment in Pullman, Washington. Love Luke Falk and Mike Leach in this situation as they're going to run an up-tempo offense. They're going to keep USC's defense on their heels. I think Washington State wins this game outright. Matt and I like it and Joe, as our upset special of the and, week. And Joe, one of the reasons that this was a, a a great pick for us is it gives you one more day of the week that you can lay a bet. So, I mean, this was another bonus here. You can go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You can get a four-game stretch right, and into Monday. Yeah, like yeah, it. exactly. Yeah, love it. <laughs> game number two, Florida State. We're going to lay seven and a half at Wake Forest. The Seminoles haven't started 0-3 since 1976. They're 0-2 right now after being humiliated by Alabama and losing at home to NC State last week. The country's off them. Everyone thinks Florida State is packing it in. They're finished. Forget about them. They got to get right before the Miami game next week. Wake Forest is 4-0, but it's come against Appalachian State, who they played last week and got outgained 494 to 344 total yards. They were lucky there. They ended up beating teams like Presbyterian, Boston College, Utah State. This is where the talent discrepancy shows itself. This is where Florida State puts one on the board. Lay the 7.5 with the Seminoles at Wake Forest. Game number three. Matt and I went back and forth on this one. I'm not sure how much he loves it, but the thought process is it's a 100% contrarian play. The Georgia Bulldogs are undefeated. 
They just shellacked Mississippi State, and they're traveling to Tennessee to play a volunteers team that is absolute garbage. Everyone's calling for Butch Jones' head. Two weeks ago, they blew it with the Hail Mary against Florida. Last week, they needed every second on the board to get past a lousy UMass team. So now here comes Georgia at seven and a half points, right? Everybody on the square side of the equation is going to love Georgia here. Something stinks. Tennessee's on the bye next week. I think they get right here. The Volunteers plus seven and a half over Georgia. Yeah, I think the, un- I think the over is a good play there as well. I think there's going to be some points scored there in Knoxville. All right, moving on to our Thursday night game. We got Chicago and Green Bay. Chicago's hitting the road, going up to Lambeau Field. This one opens up with Green Bay laying seven. Now it's jumped in the direction of Green Bay in a couple of places. Seven and a half, but most places has stayed flat at seven. Joe, you're first on this one. For people that are are joining us early on as we post this podcast, what do you think about the Thursday night game? Let's see if you get it right. The Chicago Bears are 3-10 and 10 against the spread in their last 13 games against the Green Bay Packers. The Packers got beat up early against the Bengals. Do not expect them to come out and allow that to happen a second week in a row. This is going to be a focused Packer team in primetime football. The Bears have a lot of trouble at Lambeau Field. I would lay the 7 if you can still find it, which there are some out there. Lay the 7 with the Packers. I'd also open up a couple six-point teasers with Green Bay to get set for a big weekend. You want to talk about the most unlikely win, basically, in the history of football is whenever you see this Bears win over the Steelers here. You look, and Ben Roethlisberger threw for 235 and a touchdown. Everything's great. You look at Mike Glennon. He threw for 101 yards in this game, and of those 101 yards, 26 went to Jordan Howard, 24 went to Tariq Cohen, and 17 went to Zach Miller, and 23 went to Benny Cunningham. By the way, guys, that's three running backs and a tight end. He had <laughs> he had 11 yards passing to wide receivers in this game. How in the hell do you win a game with 11 yards th- thrown to your wide receivers? It's not going to happen here, Joe. This Packers team, very ups. I, I think this is a kind of the, the state. We talk about statement games. I think this is kind of the Packers statement right here to show, hey, we are for real. Aaron Rodgers is going to come out and have a huge game here. All right, gentlemen, and to round us out today on the Play Action Podcast, your lock of the week. Joe, you're up first. What do you got? Two of them this week. I'm going to play under Seattle, Indianapolis, 41 and a half total points. You do not bet against the Seahawks in prime time at Century Link Field. Jacoby Brissett and the Indianapolis offense are going to struggle mightily to move the football. I don't see him putting 10 points on the board. Conversely, with the offensive line and running game issues Seattle has incurred this season, I don't see them hanging 31 on the board in this game. We're going to go under 41 and a half Colts, Seahawks. Sunday night primetime. Game number two, I'll take seven, hopefully getting more with San Francisco at Arizona. Ten days to get ready. The Cardinals are on the short week. It's easy to overlook this game. And this is a one-dimensional Cardinal offense that cannot run the football. I think the Niners keep it tight and somehow possibly find a way to win this thing. All right, Matt, over to you. Have the Bengals been bad? Yes. Have they disappointed? (laughs) Yes. Are the Browns worse? The answer to that is also yes. We are looking at just three points at at least four to five books as of this taping right now. Rush out, get those three points, and the Bengals are going to beat the Browns. It doesn't matter that it's a road game. The Browns understand what's going on. They need to be a bottom. They need to be a bottom three team yet again to get another pick in there, and this, they're going to do that. Like Joe mentioned earlier in the show, they know how to tank and make it look like they're not tanking. Also, I believe in this New England offense. I think there's no reason for us to believe that they're not going to continue rolling as long as they are healthy. Gronkowski is healthy. Hogan looked healthy last week, caught a couple of touchdowns, and of course, whatever they want to do in the backfield that day seems to work as well. Only nine points here against a Carolina team that I can't see uh, uh, any way in the world for them to keep this within 10. You're down Greg Olson. At best, a banged up Kelvin Benjamin. They're going to have to just go to the back out of the backfield, and that's not going to get it done. Give me New England minus nine. All right. Enjoy week four. Thank you so much for being with us alongside Matt Brown and Joe Fortenbaugh. My name's Dave Fair. Thank you for watching and listening to the Play Action Podcast.